Off top. The faster you move, the slower time moves. Play music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. Beautiful new set. My man Charlie Kravitz in the building. We're going to have some fun today. Wozni later to talk basketball. It's a hilarious, fun, and informative conversation. So hang around for that. The best. <laughs> yeah, Wozni's fun. And yeah, never mind. I won't spoil any of it for anyone, but stick around for that. Before we get to that, football. Football. All right, where do you want to start? Uh, so. I want to talk about what's going on sort of in media circles after the Super Bowl because we're now a couple days out and you turn on, get up, and you see you on a set making faces because people are just absolutely ripping Kyle Shanahan and they're ripping him for a number of decisions that were in or out of his control. Obviously, him taking the ball first in overtime, uh, sort of how conservative he can be on certain third downs. Now, obviously, he went for the big fourth down that they converted George Kittle, but still. Uh, not adjusting defensively, whether or not that was him or Steve Wilkes, who knows. But my question coming out of that, do you think that the criticism that's been put on Shanahan is warranted or is just a game where he had some bad luck? Yeah, I mean, I think criticism is warranted for anybody, especially high profile. But I think some of the criticism has been hyperbolic in that it's maybe he can't get it done. Can he get past? And I understand. I like I work in sports television. I understand that part of it is just sports television. But it feels like a real thing because people are attaching the Falcons loss to him and they're attacking, attaching that last Super Bowl. No, I'm not saying okay, the Falcons one. I'm not saying that you shouldn't hang these losses on him. But to jump to the conclusion that now he's not going to be able to done, that's the part that confuses me and – it's kind of annoying is that and it happens when we talk about quarterbacks too where once you get to a certain level of success then we're going to start comparing you to that higher group yeah and when you're comparing people to that higher group and i'm guilty of this sometimes too you start to say things that make it seem like the person that you're talking about isn't even good and like kyle shanahan is still arguably the best offensive mind in football yeah. He's gotten to the Super and if you list his accomplishments, he's gotten to the Super Bowl with two quarterbacks that no one really thinks are great, an offensive line that's not very good right now, and a defense that's kind of fallen off. And he had leads, and this is where it gets ten point leads. Yeah, ten point leads against uh, Patrick Mahomes in both of those games and a bigger lead against 24 point lead, right? Against or 28, 28 to three, 28 to three. Yeah. That's a 25 point lead against uh, the Patriots when he was with the Falcons and people jump to the conclusion that like he can't coach in the postseason and he does need to get better at clock management. He does need to be aggressive. And the fairest criticism in this last week's game is that he chose to receive the ball. And then it's not even that he chose to receive the ball. It's that he chose to receive the ball. And then he chose to kick the field goal when they were down uh, within the red zone. That was the thing. That well, it's also play. and that his players didn't know the rule. Yeah. And so I get that. His players not knowing the rule. I can forgive that some because it's not going to change the way they play. I guess if you get to. uh Maybe it changes the way that Purdy plays or the decision that Purdy makes, but I don't really think so. You're not going to play any harder or any less. You're already in a Super Bowl at overtime. Right. Him telling you the rules is going to change the way you play. But what I didn't get is when you kick – or excuse me, when you get them down there and you're inside their 10, you have them backed up, you have the ball, you're in the red zone, you could either score or kick the field goal. You go for it on third down, you don't get it done. The reason why I think that you must go for it on fourth there is because – the scenario that you're hoping for is that you score, then you kick it off to them and stop them. So why not go for it then? Then if you don't score, you have them backed up in great field position, which is essentially what you're going to create the next time around, right? Can you imagine if they'd scored that touchdown and they started celebrating like they won the Super Bowl because yeah. they didn't know the rule? That was the only thing that would have been hilarious. I like it would have been the best case scenario <laughs> for for you who wants to laugh. But yeah, that that's a fair criticism. So I find myself very quickly. So immediately after the game, like yeah, let's criticize him. Let's say what he can do better, how he can get better, and he should. And Andy Reid is the perfect guy across on the other sideline because Andy Reid was that guy. 
that we thought of like this when he was with the Eagles. But now he's not. But then you hear the way people are reacting, and it's different than the way we talked about Andy Reid. Like, people were – Andy Reid just was sort of before yeah, sports Twitter yeah, in a exactly. certain way. I think that's the difference. Because there were clock management jokes about Andy Reid. Yeah, like, I know. I remember – so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm here for the jokes. It felt like to me, and maybe it was in my own little bubble, that we weren't we weren't doing jokes. We were like, can he get it done? Should they move on from him? Like, is, will he ever get past Patrick Mahomes? Like, guys, he could have won. Like, he's very close to winning well, two of these games. And smart football fans are often pointing out sample size. These are two football games. He lost two football games. It does not, And he was in position to win them both. Acting like he's done is just – or he's uh, inferior in like some uh, way that he's not going to be able to address. To me, that's where the problem is. So I've, I have a bunch of follow-up questions that I want to okay. get through. So the first one is, can I, can I drop some names? All right. Name I, was on, I was on Radio Row at the Oh, season. yeah. Oh, we promised the people a Vant recap. We're going to have to do that later because we're, yeah, we had technical difficulties, so we will get to the Vant recap eventually. Maybe we snuck in one Vant story last time. Maybe we can sneak in another one here. So anyway, what you got? So I was on Radio Row with uh, Mina, and we were speaking to Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward, and we specifically asked all of them about the hell that Kyle Shanahan puts defenses in and particularly the conflict they put uh, linebackers in and miles garrett admittedly played against uh the 49ers during brocktober when they were at brock bottom when they were missing Devo and trent williams um but what he was saying is we got interior pressure we played man and that's what put pretty yeah. in, in, in a in a tough spot right and then you look at the game plan that the Chiefs were able to execute against the 49ers. They played so much cover zero, so much cover one, and they blitzed the hell out of Purdy, and it, it completely threw a loop. If you're Kyle Shanahan and you have this amount of talent, you have six all pros on offense, um, your defense has you know the reigning defensive player of the year from last year. At a certain point, can you not adjust to that type of coverage? I know your yeah, system is built a certain way. Yeah, no, there. So this is an interesting question. It might get a little football nerdy. I'll try to keep it. Yeah, I'll try to keep it as high level as possible. But as you know, one of my many maxims is trade offs. You're going mm -hmm. to have to make some trade offs. And so this system is designed around the uniquely dynamic or uniquely versatile players that Kyle Shanahan has. And even before the players get there. A lot of this system is about winning on first down and second down. They don't want to be in third down. Yeah, It's winning on first down and second down by running the ball effectively and play action. Play action works best when the opponents are in zone because the, the zone opponents have responsibilities behind them for the pass and run res gap responsibilities in front of them. If you can get them guessing and confused, then you can take advantage of it. The reason why man works is – I don't have – it's very clear. I go where he goes. If he runs yeah. a route and he and they run the ball, that ain't my fault because he's the one that's responsible for blocking me and I can address it. If uh, if they run the ball, you're in good situation there. Your box is already loaded if you're man coverage. So, like, that's why that works against there. The answer to that, and this is where the interesting conversation about guys like Debo and Ayuk come, and Kittle come into this, mm -hmm. the answer to that, if you're going to get in man coverage – Man coverage is hard. Finding corners, and this is why this system is so effective, is name a team that has two or three good cover corners and a good cover safety and a good cover linebacker like, yeah. that can play man coverage tight enough that they won't give up any plays all game or any debilitating plays all game. If you have a team that can do that, then, yeah, Kyle Shanahan is in trouble. But you know who else is in trouble? Every damn body. Everybody's in trouble if you can play lockdown man coverage all around the field. And part of the problem, and I'm hesitant to be critical, let's just again say that there are great players, even great players have some shortcomings. And the reason why Debo is great is also one of the shortcomings. Is Debo is an incredible run after catch player, physical, tough, strong guy. Debo ain't routing nobody up. So if you are capable of tackling well and playing man coverage against Debo, then and you just isolate him and let him go man coverage against good to great corners, he does not have the advantage there. Ayuk is a good receiver, but he's not like a true number one yeah. that's going to to kill people. Second team all pro. Yeah, but I mean, 
when you go down the list of top 10 receivers, it's going to be a while before you get to Brandon Ayuk. You're going to yeah. be outside the 10. And the one player that they have that I do think in space and man coverage is ridiculous is Christian McCaffrey. If you get the matchups there where you can hold on. And Kittle, too, is another guy who you would like him against linebackers and against most safeties, too. But I think that's like it's the give and the take of the offense. And yes, they'll be tougher in that situation. And yeah, they'll have a harder time on third downs because of those same problems. And yeah, they might have a hard time coming back, even though they had two comebacks in the playoffs because of those same situations. But they're going to beat the out of a lot of people first. And it reminds me a lot of like the Lamar Jackson conversation where it's like, all right, Lamar is not going to precision people to death if you're down by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter. But you know what? You are rarely going to be down by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter because of Lamar Jackson. I think the same thing is true for Kyle Shanahan and Shanahan offenses. Yeah. And, you know, can I admit something? Yeah. I So Patrick Mahomes is inevitable. Yes. And, like, he makes his own luck and – there have been, you know, the Super Bowl he lost to Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady, who are the yeah. two best quarterbacks of all time, and make these things happen. Mm-hmm. But I kind of look at that game and like Shanahan got, they did get really unlucky at certain points. Yeah. Like the six of the seven fumbles in that game being recovered by the Chiefs, Dre Greenlaw tearing his Achilles running onto the field. And then you, you want to talk about it being man coverage? Like yeah. Travis Kelsey was essentially a non factor in that game. And then he just torched the backup linebacker Burks, and Oren yeah. Burks, like it was, they were eight for eight in the targets against that guy after he, after he replaced Greenlaw and like those things, it just adds to the, and the punt bouncing off a dude's leg. Yeah. Like these are uh, random and things. Score a touchdown on the next play. <laughs> if it was crazy. I mean, like yeah. it really does add to just, Kyle. Right. I mean, I, do you think and then if of- you go back to the other Super Bowl, Garoppolo, like throw it one yard shorter. Well, that one's less luck. That's like, no, I mean, yeah, I guess you, you can say it's because Garoppolo isn't good enough, but it's not because yeah. Shanahan isn't good enough. Yeah. Like the play worked. That's what that was Kyle's part. Yeah, Shanahan, he's got such a sad face when things go wrong. Yeah, it's just, and he, you know, he grew up around it and stuff. Yeah. So like, it means a little something. To, like, it feels like his. I guess all coaches' identity is tied up in it. But him having it happen so many times, uh, just feels sad for him. That photo of him on the floor of the locker room holding the football behind the equipment cart. He, I mean, unbelievable. He just, it was a tragic figure. It could have been like someone, the guy who does the uh, like sports, but make it art account should take that. Cause I guarantee you there's some Greek mythological figure in that exact post. Um, All right. So the follow-up I have on this, and this is now we're going to get into um, the Florio report. So who knows the exact validity of these reports. He claims to have talked to an NFL insider about this. I believe him. Um, He said that he could see Kyle Shanahan needing to move on to win a Super Bowl. Um, this is interesting. Their window has all of these guys in their late twenties or early thirties. They also have Brock Purdy on a deal through 2025. That is incredibly team friend friendly, but I think there are, I think Brock Purdy's really good. I think building a team is different when you're paying him $50 million a year. I think that's a fair, fair thing to say, no matter what mm-hmm. you think of as a football player. So I would ask you, do you think Kyle Shanahan needs to win next year with this core or that he needs to find a new situation after that? Yeah. I mean, I think that he probably does need to win next year with this core. Does he need to find a new situation after that? I would say no. And maybe I'm just risk averse, but we take for granted all the moving parts that you have to have solidified in order to create a consistent competitor. Mm -hmm. And he's done it. And they remade this team on the fly already a couple times and has success. And that's in part because of the, in large part because of Kyle Shanahan, but also in part because of John Lynch and the general manager and the ownership structure and just having a system that works. So assuming that you can go somewhere else and build it again is a big assumption to me. I think we could point across the side and Andy Reid is someone who did it. Yes. But there's probably a lot more examples of people who weren't able to go somewhere else and create that success or people who stayed where they were. Like, I think um, Harbaugh comes to mind. Mm-hmm. John comes to mind as they were going to move on from, but stick around till you get a quarterback or mm-hmm. you stick around till you get uh, a new offense, offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator and you figure it out. Or until Joe Flacco blacks out for four straight games. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I that was the first one. Yeah. I'm saying he stuck around until Lamar came and yeah. then added to that. And I think that having the – if the system is broken, so that's about 
the hard part. I think it's yeah. diagnosing what the problem is. You don't just change parts because you aren't having success. If you're if you can pinpoint exactly why you aren't having success and then you can change that part. And that's the Ravens come to mind as an organization that was run really well, but were falling on hard times. And they pinpointed the reason why they weren't having success and they needed an upgraded quarterback and they got that. And they were actually considering moving on. Like that was the rumor before Lamar came in and won six in a row. They're like, we're going to move on from John Harbaugh, which kind of seems silly to me because nothing about the way they acquire talent, the way that they integrate talent seemed to me like they were broken. And I think that would be a mistake for, for Kyle or for the 49ers to be like, Hey, this ain't working. We don't know why let's change some things. Let's just move some stuff around. Do you think Purdy's going to get better with this first healthy off season? Yeah, I think that's a good, so to your point about, do they have to win it right now? Um, I think the question is, can they have success in the future around Brock Purdy? I think so. I think given what he's shown us so far, it's really impressive at this point in his yeah, career. He was fine in that game. Yeah. We say it all the time around here is that the best quarterbacks in football are the ones that come in in a good situation. He came in in a good situation and he's been playing well and he's going to have his first full healthy offseason. I think for them to continue to compete in the future, he's going to have to get better. Mm-hmm. I also believe that because Kyle Shanahan is such a good coach that the assumption is that you need great players to be great, which is true. But I think you can put players, because it's such an interdependent game, how great players are is a lot dependent on his circumstances. And I think Kyle Shanahan is the best in football at getting the best out of all of his players. So given that, they'll rebuild. Like I have no, there's no reason for me to believe after next year when they have to start making these tough choices, there's no reason for me to believe that Kyle and, um, and John are not going to be able to figure out the players they need later in the draft and how they can use them to make things more challenging because as much as we love the skill players they have now their o-line is not great but they still manufacture a really good running attack and like we mentioned the limitations of some of their players they'll still they still manage to have one of the best offenses in the league the real question is they're gonna get this defense back on track yeah i mean on our call we were talking about this before the show and you said that one of the things that kyle shanahan wants as a, a quarterback is like someone who's okay that he can mold to be great do you think that's I, I hear that, and I wonder if that's sort of an indictment on Shanahan. Like, yeah. Can you imagine another coach not wanting someone yeah. who can like, yeah, create outside of that? So I don't want to mislead anybody. I don't think that Kyle Shanahan wants a quarterback that's not that's just good and just okay. I think Kyle Shanahan is the best in the league at bringing the best out of okay, mediocre quarterbacks. I'm not sure. We haven't seen him with a great quarterback. I think Matt Ryan is the closest thing to that, but – the more I learned about what was happening there, it's a lot more about Kyle scheming and Julio being great. They didn't call him Matty Ice because he was clutch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google a, it. Yeah. It's a lot more about those things than it was about uh, Matt Ryan being special. So the reason why I think it's it's fair to ask the question, mm-hmm. at least, is because his offense does not leave a lot of room for ad-libbing. Although I guess maybe Brock Purdy pushes because he was ad living in this game and maybe Brock Purdy is an example. And we know that they wanted that quarterback saying that he doesn't want that quarterback is crazy. They traded up to get Trey Lance because they thought he would be that quarterback. So I think Kyle wants it. It'll be interesting to see. I, I don't know if I think it was the athletic before the game. There's an article about how much of a control freak Kyle Shanahan is. Yeah. And like he's overseeing big brother style, all the meeting rooms like that is not a trait that is just isolated to the meeting rooms. He's a big brother to his quarterback too. It's not a lot of at the line change. It's not a lot of flexibility in the offense. And I think what that does is it creates a smaller bandwidth for uh, execution. It brings up the floor for every quarterback, but it brings down the ceiling yeah. too. And so, yeah, if you have a quarterback like Patrick Mahomes, that is his own high floor and the ceiling is forever, then you don't have to be nearly as uh, controlling of a coach. Maybe that's maybe it's a chicken or egg situation. Maybe he became this way because most quarterbacks aren't that good. <laughs> and this offense is developed because most quarterbacks aren't that good. All right. Before we get to Waz, any any uh, Gallivant story you want to share? Because I have one. You can go first. <laughs> OK, well, I got a pre-Gallivant story that I want to tell. You stole my bag. 
That's how we kicked off the oh, trip. Oh, my, this God. Fool, this oh fool my God. This fool stole my bag. Oh, plane. Okay, so we're on the plane. Uh, Charlie's one row in front of me. We land, and everybody gets off the plane, and I get up to grab my bag, and I don't see my bag. And so I wait, let people get off, and still looking for my bag, and then I noticed that there's a bag on here that looks a little bit like my a bag. A little bit. Not the exact same blue away suitcase. A little bit like my bag. It has we can take the pictures. Same model. Don't start defending yourself. You asked me if I had a story to tell, I'm telling a story. Yeah. Look a little bit like my bag. And I was like, oh, I get it. This person, this likely elderly person forgot and just didn't think about it. And fortunately, I'm like stressed a little bit. It's like, oh, I guess I should have to go shopping or something, but whatever, no big deal. But I see, because I assume this person thinks that they have their bag, so they're going to take it all the way to their hotel. And it won't be a problem. But I see that there's a tag on here. And I was like, oh, cool. I called Charlie. I'm like, hey, Charlie, wait for me. I'm in here trying to figure out my bag situation. Oh, this sucks. And Charlie's like, oh, yeah, that sucks. Let me look at this tag and get this person to call. Is it Carrie? Hold on. This is your carry. I got your bag. That's of, right. Of the, That's right. I don't know, 200 people that are on that plane, Charlie managed to be the right okay, one. Okay, but steal my they bag. were blue away suitcases, the same exact color, directly next to each other in the overhead bin, and I just grabbed the wrong one. Attention to detail. Yours had a tag, mine didn't. You can't be great without attention to detail. So my Gallivant story that I'll tell really quickly. Okay. We were at a party on Thursday night. Oh and gosh, we were this just, is a story. We were just marveling. I'll, we'll show the picture of it. On okay. YouTube. We were just marveling at the sheer size of Lane Johnson. Oh. Even amongst NFL linemen, Lane Johnson just looked enormous and and scary and, and scary. lots of diamonds. It was like Debo. He looked like Debo. His chain was outrageous. Yeah, it was very. I I, I assume that he didn't pay for it. I assume he took that chain from yeah. somebody because that's the only way that a man like that lives. But we were there. We were like. With our friend Sanjay, who's going to come and recap the Gallivan yeah. if we hadn't had tech issues. And we were, I said, Sanjay, do you have chat GPT plus? And he's like, of course I do. And, uh, <laughs> Sanjay's a nerd. Uh, I was like, can you ask it to draw a gigantic troglodyte <laughs> at a Super Bowl party surrounded by podcasters? <laughs> that that <laughs> AI drew exactly. Lane Johnson, it was like Johnson. Kevin Clark, Bill Barnwell, and me. <laughs> Oh gosh! Oh, You're sorry, Lane Johnson. You're more yeah. handsome than this struggle that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also, somebody I forgot. Really Jack, though. I forgot who I, I had a couple drinks, so I forgot who. But somebody said that he could beat Lane Johnson. You? Oh, it was me. You kept walking around me like I should fight him. I should. I could. I would. I wouldn't mind finding out to see how far I can get. You know, like playing basketball against LeBron. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sorry, Lane. I'm just joking. Let's talk to Wazdi. Bye. Let's talk basketball with maybe the first Foxworth show a Hall of Fame inductee. <laughs> Was the Lambre. Um we don't have to bore the people with all the things that just went on, but just know that Wozni is a bleeping hero. Truly. And I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you so much. So uh Charlie, let's stop wasting this man's time and talk basketball. All right, guys. We're taping this on Tuesday, the night after Victor Wembanyama got a triple double with blocks, and I think it's become clear that the hype was warranted with a guy who is that big, that skilled, that athletic, and unfortunately, he's playing on a sport Spurs team that is currently that bad. But this begs a really interesting question, which is, how quickly do this uh, can the Spurs become a contending team in the West? And how should they get there? Should they build organically? Should they build through trades? What's the path to competency for a team with a guy this good, this young? What do you think, Wazzy? I mean, to me, because he's so young, obviously you have cost control for so freaking long, and he's so obviously good. I think you should just practice patience. Um, and that's through the draft and through acquiring vets that make sense for, you know, reasonable prices. Yeah. There's no reason to chase anything at this point it's watch this guy develop try to bring in pieces that will be complimentary and take it from there I, I like i don't see any reason to be to jump the gun or take a specific approach because he's right. he's shown you such malleability while also being really good young it's it's incredible and you know bring up somebody like a ben simmons Right. who was the quote-unquote one of the answers to the process 
whose game had to be so catered to in the building of the roster around him. Just never missed a chance to I'm come just, at Ben Simmons. Just, this question had nothing about Ben Simmons. Just, I was gonna I'm I was actually saying. gonna I was actually gonna say something that could have led you to Ben Simmons, but you brought him up anyway just because you need to can I before sure. you start bagging on Ben Simmons. I will say that I get I love it. it. I, you can keep going. Yeah. Ben Simmons. <laughs> I mean, it's great with me. <laughs> um he ain't he's not even relevant at this point. But anyway, um I get it. And obviously I agree with you is that you can't force anything with any player, but maybe it's because Joel Embiid is on the sideline right now. And mm. because he has been that in and out argument. and because, yeah, like, and because Victor has become one of them guys quickly. Uh, some people may have believed that it would have taken him longer than this. We won't name any names, but he there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the point, and the point I'm making is that person. We don't see seven foot seven dudes who be out here cooking like yeah. this for extended periods of time. And I guess Kareem comes to mind as a big guy who had longevity. Tim Duncan is too, but nobody was this big yeah. in this coordinator. So that's the pushback for why you might want to go all in as soon as possible. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm looking at what some people will call the model rebuild right now, and that's the OKC Thunder. Yeah. And just the idea that they haven't skipped any steps. Like, even at the trade deadline just now, they're just like, ah, Gordon Hayward, who barely ever plays, that's good enough for this team that's contending for number one in the West. Because they look at it as like, look, we're just going to watch, see what our young guys succeed and fail at, and we'll take it from there. Right. We'll try to, you know, sort of buttress what they do from there. And to me, I think the Spurs should try to take that same approach to what Victor is doing. It's just try to get the right pieces. Don't just get young pieces, you know, a la Detroit that that are all like <laughs> just they don't fit with each other. There's no rhyme or reason to what these guys are doing. I think you should get a team together that actually makes some type of sense. I tend to agree, but can I play devil's advocate for one second? And this is a trade that we know is most likely a bad trade, which is what the Wolves did bringing in Rudy Gobert. They gave I mean, up. Well, they're number one they're right not, now. Well, that's exactly right. They're, I hated that trade. I'm just saying they gave up. Uh, they gave a godfather offer for a market that probably wasn't that strong for Rudy right. Gobert. They gave up five first round picks and Walker Kessler and et cetera, et cetera, to get Rudy Gobert. But what it did, which I think is really interesting, is they believed that Anthony Edwards was a guy. Right. And they were like, uh, this guy's good enough now. Let's see what we got here. We know this is a precious time to have someone this good, this young, playing this well. Let's see if we can get to the top of the West. Rudy Gobert instantly gives you a top flight defense. And that's interesting because you don't need to spend the five first round picks on a Rudy Gobert type of player with Victor. Like if Clean the Glass already has him as like a top two percentile defensive player with the on off numbers. You put him out there with bums, you're going to have a solid defense at the rim. But I do wonder is there any. Anything that you think, if you're ahead of schedule, maybe we do go slightly more all in to just see how serious of an outfit we are right now with the Spurs. I mean, as as with anything, what, what you should be trying to do, any team needs, you know, great creation on the perimeter. So the Spurs... Mm -hmm. The, no matter what, I don't care how good Victor Wembanyama becomes, he'll never be some perimeter ball dominant guy right. uh, that you run every single thing on your offense to. Even as great as Joel Embiid is, he's been at his best with James Harden, clear all star guy who's headed to the Hall of Fame as a creator, and Maxi, who's turned himself into a straight up bona fide all star. Like, even mm -hmm. as great as Joel is, you still need a perimeter-oriented player who can score efficiently or, you know, create for others in an elite fashion to make this thing go. So there's still going to be in the market for that type of player, but they'll have, you know, cracks at the apple. Yeah. I, all right. So obviously the risk for going all in is that you mortgage your future and then you make it harder to build around Victor later on. But there is also risk for the OKC way. The OKC way is the way that you go about things when you don't have a superstar. Mm. Like that's how you go about things in order to acquire a superstar. Right. So like assuming that someone's going to come along and I guess this is another it leads me to another interesting thought is. There was a time in the NBA, and I'm not sure if that time is here or has passed, but it feels less important. But there was a time when it was incumbent on your star to recruit people to come to you. 
<laughs> I don't know what Victor, what his, uh, what his game is like. I don't know if Victor can spit, but he needs to get people there because I think the argument for doing it OKC way only makes sense if you can be patient. And I'm not sure you can how patient you can be when you have a player this good. They they were waiting around and they knew everyone knew we could give OKC some junk until uh, they wanted to move on from PG and get SGA like. It just, I just smiling like I'm saying something crazy. No, I was just looking at the 2024 free agent class. I was imagining him calling up LeBron and being like, come to San Antonio. <laughs> That's the last person. That's the last person. <laughs> just, you caught me in a moment of giggling uh, at the GM. <laughs> I mean, because I think, so I, I, I want to hear Wozni respond to those two things. One is, do we... Do we need and Victor's young too, so his peers are not quite ready yet. Yeah. So one is do does Victor need to uh be on the recruiting trail? And two, do you acknowledge that at least there is some risks to doing it the right way, so to speak, like the OKC way and not going all in? Because you may not hit in the draft. NBA draft ain't the NFL draft. Sometimes ain't nobody in it. <laughs> and assuming that you're going to get a difference maker in it is not going to work out. So to me, the OKC way, if there even is a way, is just the idea that they have an MVP guy now, right? Mm -hmm. And when they traded for Shea Gilgis Alexander, I watched him up close his rookie year with the Clippers. Nobody thought that man was a future MVP right. candidate. And I mean nobody. People thought he was a nice player. I remember I remember hearing people compare him his rookie year to Penny Hardaway, and my old <laughs> got offended. I was like, whoa, hold up. Penny Hardaway, do you guys remember 1993? Not even, like, are, yeah. are you crazy? So uh, th they got lucky in a sense, and I think the Spurs have already gotten lucky. They yeah. drafted Victor yeah. Wimbenyama, right? Yeah. And the rest of it has to, you know, sort of fit around that 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 incredible luck that they've happened upon. And I guess, you know, the injury stuff is interesting. I, I think the way that you you do go about bringing somebody else in, you still, you have to get lucky again. You have right. to be like, oh, maybe Atlanta's sick and tired of Trey Young, right? And that's, maybe we That's can the name get, I was gonna ask about. Maybe we can get in the, the Trey Young market or maybe some other quasi franchise guy, maybe, the Minnesota thing turns into something. You say, yo, why don't I pair Victor with Carl Anthony Towns, a generational mm. offensive talent, right? And Victor's so good at defense, he'll paper over all of Carl Anthony Towns' problems. Those are the kind of guys they got to trade for. People who are under contract for a long time and their teams have already decided this ain't going to happen for them here. I, I mean, I, I get it. I get it. The, you're talking about people in this phase of their career, not necessarily individuals, because the, the cat yes. thing don't make sense to me. And maybe I'm not a basketball, I'm not a sharp enough basketball well, mind to appreciate good? it. No, no, no. Cat is an incredibly talented shooter and a skilled officer. He's the best player. big man shooter since Dirk, according to himself. Yeah. yeah. But I don't need that. <laughs> Vic, Vic can stretch the floor. I do not need that. I mean, obviously, maybe you. Maybe you bring them in and you can move them to get somebody, a perimeter player. Waz, I do have a question about the type of creator you think would pair with Wembenyama because that was actually one of the interesting things about the trade deadline. Both DeJounte Murray and Trey Young were rumored to the Spurs in, in different ways. Um, obviously, neither one of those rumors had credence, but that just is, uh, I think, a litmus test to think of what Victor needs. Do you want to shoot first guy like Trey Young? Who's an incredibly high usage yeah. rate guy? Great passer, though, right? Great passer. Yeah. Trey Young um, but is one I mean, of the like, best passers in the league. Yeah, but or do you want someone who is a true secondary tertiary option and a Jante Murray, assuming he'll start playing defense again and can fill the stat sheet in different ways? What What do you think is the better way to build with Victor? I think if I have my druthers, I'm gonna go with the bona fide score and mm -hmm. have confidence that the playmaking can come because. What Victor presents as a pick and pop and pick and roll threat, like that makes those reads so much easier. When defenses don't know what to load up on, do like just look at what Boston is doing offensively now that they have Chris Stapps, right? They don't have no playmaking, y'all. The only person who really passes the ball for real is Derek White on that team. But because they can spread you out so freaking thin and the lanes are so wide open and when teams have to send help, the help is so obvious, like you can sort of you know, you can paper over not having Jason Kidd on your freaking team, right? So if you tell me you can get a guy who's a bona fide 
I'm going to beat the guy in front of me 95% of the time, you know, even against the best set defenses in the playoffs. I'm going to lean towards that than a dude who is like, you know, super cerebral and will do the great playmaking and connecting. I'm I'm always going to go towards that because of the, the skill level and the talent of the big. Like, if I have a guy who's legitimately protecting the rim and then on offense, he's legitimately spacing people. Like, the, yeah. it's just your team becomes something so much easier to build. I remember, so I saw Victor in his first summer league game, and obviously that doesn't translate completely. But the big question that I had when you see a player like that is, how is he in space? And we saw, like, all the highlights from France. And I'm coming off the football season, so I'm going to be honest with y'all. I've seen very little Victor other than highlights. But is he comfortable out in space in the pick and roll? Yeah. Yeah. Or is he somebody you can you can um, isolate because he's – I mean, I guess he's so long that once you take three steps, he just got to take one to close on you? I mean, to me, the, the sort of distance that you have to figure out how and what to close, that just takes a lot of time, practice, yeah. Yeah. and seeing it. What I've seen right. from him that I'm already like, all right, he's got that, is when he switches out on somebody one-on-one -on -one in space, 22 feet from the basket, he does not look uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, yes, he hasn't perfected every single nuance of pick and roll coverage. He's not Kevin Garnett yet, but he but seems not to be on his freaking way for sure. And to back it up, their defense per 100 possessions gets 10.2 points better, and yeah. the free throw rate goes down by 6.1%. The effective field goal percentage goes down. So whether or not those are uh, direct indicators of the pick and roll, given how much spread, spread right. pick and rolls played, he yeah. has to be at least competent at protecting parts of the rim for that to happen. Yeah, I do want to, um, I mean, some of the dream pairings will never happen. Obviously, right. someone like Halliburton is the perfect guy, oh, but wow. the perfect person is actually going to be the segue to our next topic because oh. he is running the New York Knicks. Oh. And that's Jalen <laughs> and, uh, Waz, Why did we to... start with Jalen Brunson with Wozni? <laughs> well, you're about to see uh you're about to see some marital strife, Wozni, because we're gonna we're about to argue about Jalen Brunson, who I love, who Dominique thinks is a stumpy fire hydrant. <laughs> wow. I gotta do you think because I do, do you think Jalen Brunson and the resurgent oh, deep as the Pacific Ocean New York Knicks are actually good enough to win the East? Yeah, I think they're good enough if a bunch of things break in their direct in their direction. Uh like a major injury to somebody in Boston's lineup. Uh everybody on the Milwaukee Bucks can like basically hating each other uh by the time the postseason comes and they're like completely dysfunctional, right? I mean Philadelphia, come on, man. Give me a break. Yeah. Nobody's taking that game, game on, I'm, I'm, <laughs> Come right. on, man. Um, and yeah, and so like I think there's a way that they could get to the finals. Would if I was drafting finals favorites out of the East, you know, they'd probably be in that fourth oh. range or whatever. Yeah. You gave you gave my man Charlie an idea. He loves to do drafts. So, so next week it seems like we're gonna be drafting teams out of the East. He, he got so excited across the You field. think I, I haven't it. already ranked them? Yeah. <laughs> So the, the funny thing is, Charlie was so excited because every time we the three of us get together, you and I are more likely to end up aligned. And I can sure. see Charlie so excited about ganging up on me. And alas, the man no. who loves the Knicks agrees <laughs> with me, even though he's an L.A. boy now. He agrees with me. Yeah, He said there was a path. Oh, you, yeah, I, did, I never said there wasn't a path. There's a path. I said, how they going to get past the Celtics is what I said. And it's pretty much what was he said. And then he named two or three other teams. There are a few things that have are, one thing's already broken. That's Joel Embiid. Right, Gone. Yeah. Get him out of here. See yeah. ya next yeah. year. Uh, <laughs> next one. Doc Rivers brain. Doc Rivers brain could easily break in the postseason. It's been done before. We've seen it. It happens oh. every year. They better not get up 3-1. Uh, Dame Lillard's defensive <laughs> liability. He's actually sort of a nightmare person you want guarding. Jalen Brunson, who could put him in hell. And then Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown's will, breakable. Breakable. I mean, they've, that will has gotten them to the finals already. And we've seen and the, Jimothy break it. <laughs> okay, whatever. So anyway, the point is, Wozni agrees with me. And they're a fun story. I would love to see it happen. I don't think anybody thinks it's out of the realm of possibility. However, yeah, depth is nice. Mm -hmm. High-end talent is better, and the yeah. Celtics got more of it. If I were to tell you that there was a New York Knicks who was averaging 27, 5, and 7 
on a super affordable contract. And like, let's just do blind resume. You would have thought Kevin Durant signed with the Knicks two years ago and would have been that guy. <laughs> Wazzy, what were you about to say, man? I listen to, listen to Charlie hate, hate on it. He's going to find a way What's to like, pivot to. I was just saying no, how good I, Jalen Brunson is. Nah, I know what it is, but if you're trying to pivot to a way to, to hate on KD because it's one of your favorite pass. So, Wazzy, what, what you I, say? What I will say about the OG trade, one, you're seeing the on one of the only downsides already, which is the guy has been incredibly injury prone in his career mm -hmm. but the upside has been freaking ridiculous um yes. and i think there's something to all of those plus minus records that he's freaking um breaking that every nick fan that i know has been bandying and bandying about and most importantly to this discussion about eastern conference contention i've seen og ananobi put jason tatum in a straight jacket We've mm -hmm. seen that before. On an island, just strap that fool up. And so I think they present plenty of problems for a team like Boston, for a team like Milwaukee. Like they're gonna, if they bring their full squad, they're gonna present a lot of problems. I just think ultimately offensive firepower is going to be an issue. And in the postseason, that will bring yeah. you down. I can't wait for the playoffs because uh, Charlie and I are gonna have to make some wagers or something. He's gonna have to put his money where his mouth is or some push ups Look, or something. I've, I've this man don't he don't this, believe this foolishness. I've been saying this all year, and I think this year's Boston meltdown is going to be the most epic of them all. This year we're back. <laughs> this year's Celtics meltdown is going to because just the oh, this is the 27 Yankees. Oh my god, the, the freaking media collective around this freaking team <laughs> from the second they got poor Zingas has made me sick okay yeah. and 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 so I'm I, I just can't wait for the playoffs man I really am looking forward to this thing I love it how would you compare this year's Knicks team to last year's Heat team and that's a, I know they don't have Jimmy Butler but Brunson someone 31 a game in the postseason last year was sick with Luka the year before and like this team has Tibbs' identity but I, dogs <laughs> What is the Tim's identity <laughs> one that anybody wants? Oh, Charlie, Ice. Charlie, you chill. First of all, <laughs> like, first of all, first of all, Eric Spolstra, we know, is probably the league's best coach. We know that. So that's a decided schematic advantage that they bring to every single postseason series. I would say, and Nick fans got mad at me for saying this, Bam Adebayo is so clearly better than Julius Randle. Like, he's so clearly an yeah. all-NBA <laughs> caliber player that yeah. Julius Randle is not. Even though, you know, Julius Randle has pretty fadeaways and all of that stuff. Nobody thinks Julius Randle's a better player than Bam Adebayo. And more importantly, right, he plays the five. Like, and he scores. And he's just better. And the thing that distinguishes Jimmy from Jalen Brunson is just size. It's like Jalen Brunson, ultimately, they're going to be able to throw a bunch of size at this guy. And in a way that size just doesn't bother Jimmy as much. Yeah. He's, his physicality is crazy. I, and again, offensively, the Heat, they have an actual system. Like, people don't talk about it, but they have a Golden State type of, you know, beautiful game type of system that they what's can the bring Knicks to bear, system? too. What do you, so, what, like, what, if that's beautiful game, go to day. What's the Knicks system? Hold on. Also, they were disgusting to watch offensively before they hit 50% of their threes in the playoffs. They were I despicable mean, but, to they watch been They've been despicable like, this year. Generating offense. threes is the name of the game. Like, that's what they do. Like, yeah. they're really good at it. And then they can do the individual stuff, the one-on-one -on -one stuff with Jimmy. So I just think there's a talent sort of reliability as far as like the things that Bam and Jimmy have accomplished in the postseason that doesn't yet exist on the Knicks squad. Like Julius yeah. Randle's postseason record is, it's the argument against everything, every optimistic view of the Knicks. I have no rebuttal to that, except for that. Are we sure he's going to be in their closing five in the postseason? I'm willing to believe um, Boyan could take his spot. Uh, there's no yeah, doubt about because, that. I, I, I'm willing to Bogey, believe Bogey, Hartenstein, um, OG, Josh Hart, Jalen Brunson, and let's let's roll. They're not going to just bench this guy completely in the playoffs. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of are his step back fadeaways, long twos, going to drop or not. Um, and that's that's been the bugaboo of the Knicks the last two postseasons. Can you think of a worse thing to be relied upon? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> in your life. <laughs> that segues us, to, segues us to our next topic because there's only one worse bet than Julius Randle's long twos, and that might be the health of the Clippers. Uh, and so I, I'm talking about this because the Clippers have been spectacular this season, and Kawhi has been incredibly healthy. He's already played 48 games. Um, in his last 30 games, he's shooting 56, 50, 92. Uh, a couple, they've dropped a tiny bit a couple days ago. They were number one in the West. And you look at that as a team that has Kawhi Leonard, who's been one of the best playoff performers of the last couple decades when he's been healthy. And it raises the question, is your only concern with the Clippers their health? I mean, come on. Like, yes, the health is, is number one. Um, but I would argue that the health takes a backseat to the team that's owned them since 2020, and that's the Denver Nuggets. Okay, no. um, they I don't even if they are fully healthy, the net the Nuggets are going to beat the living crap out of this team. They have their number, they're much better. The the play the continuity uh that they bring to every single playoff series, which is that Jamal Murray, Jokic two-man game, and their defense can get to a level well, uh, when it comes to the size that they bring, uh just the collective yeah. IQ. They're going to beat the Clippers up, healthy or not. And so I would say their biggest issue is that team in Denver. And the second mm -hmm. biggest issue is that their two best guys are guys that are constantly always yeah. injured in the months that we play playoff basketball. <laughs> that was that was why I wanted you to go first. Because my answer is I want Kawhi Leonard in those situations. And understanding I, I get how good Jokic is, but we've seen we've seen what Jokic has done in the postseason. And I know how talented the Nuggets are. But if we are I guess the, the stretch is a fully healthy Kawhi. That's something that we can't have faith in. But I love the concept of a fully healthy Kawhi uh, and talent around him that's healthy. But I know I can tell by the look in Charlie's eyes that this was just an elaborate way for him to <laughs> on James Harden. No, 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 no. I, he is canceled out by Kawhi Leonard. I, I mean, Waz <laughs> brings up the, the really important point, which is that Jokic is the best player in the world, and he's going to yeah. be guarded by Zubac and Mason Plumlee, and those guys have been really nice. Like Zubac has been a, had a really nice connection with James Harden, but it's completely different when you can just get completely eaten by that ornery grizzly bear coming Who from Denver. So when you said Zubac, or you said um, Jokic is being guarded by, I already oh, sorry, started, yeah, yeah, no, no, I already started sucking my teeth because I felt like <laughs> no, no matter what name you say after that, I'm not gonna feel great. Who is Daniel name? Tice Bam is not gonna make you feel great, Dominic? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like he gave Bam the blues last year. Like who is the guy that I'm gonna be like? Yeah, I like that. If it's up. so, if, on a cold night in November in Philadelphia, if Joel Embiid decides to try, <laughs> certainly not in Denver, but. On, on that night in Philadelphia, that's the matchup. Uh, speak, hold on. I just want to ask you guys just as a side, because I, I know you guys are plugged into this conversation. And I know Dominique's sympathies, but Charlie, um, when people were blaming the media for Joel Embiid, or fans, for everybody wanting to see Joel Embiid play basketball. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We, we tore the meniscus. Where were you at? It was we, us. We collectively tore this guy's meniscus because we were like, wow, um, you know, one of the best players of his generation. We want to see him play against another guy who's great of his generation who plays the same position. Shame on us for wanting to see that. The saddest part about all this is I want to blame y'all, but we had this conversation on the show when it happened. I can't in good conscience act like it's y'all fault that his meniscus was torn or that he played too much to tear his meniscus. He a big dude who moves weird. Yeah. And stuff happens and people fall on his basketball. Like, I don't think that the rule. So like the, 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 the fall was the rule. cause of the meniscus. What's not the cause? So oh, they said that was a sleight of hand. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I didn't like any of that, and I refused to engage in that unserious foolishness. <laughs> I could stand on the fact that I believe the 65 game minimum yes. is is dumb foolish but and i i wanted badly to seize on that and use it as a reason to drive the 65 game but it just felt dishonest the 65 game thing is dumb for a number of other reasons yeah. but that ain't hurt joel and yeah. that's like that's stupid so you guys win that one but <laughs> in the 65 game get rid of max contracts get rid of all of that foolishness because it makes basketball worse it does because the max contract is, is one of the biggest problems in the NBA, in my view, is because it 
for it allows for teams to load up with more superstars than they deserve, and it also yes. forces teams to pay bums that don't deserve to be at that level, which wow. hampers those teams from being successful. Get rid of max contract, get rid of salary caps, we'd be better off. You mean Carl Towns wouldn't get paid just as much as LeBron if we didn't have <laughs> max contracts? <laughs> Right. And so, like, yeah, get rid of all of that stuff. And, I, I mean, this is going to – Charlie's going to be mad now because it's going to go into a whole whole nother place. But everybody got places to go and things to do. I won't hold anybody longer. But the problem is these super rich billionaires want to find, find ways to make more money. That's why we got 82 games and a yeah. bunch of them don't matter. And they put a 65-game minimum in in order to make people play games that don't matter with intensity. And that's why they have max contracts. And that's why we have salary cap. And all of it makes the NBA worse. Yeah, the owners make the game worse. Everybody they knows do. that. I mean, that's it's true. You know, no one's disagreeing on that. Uh, I mean, it's just I, not I, that I, interesting I, to podcast about for the hundredth time. Agree. Made, this is Agreed. a point that I've made a trillion times. All I ever hear about these freaking owners and these oligarchs is how brilliant they are at business, yet they can't find a way to lower the inventory and make money. I like <laughs> these are the most brilliant business yeah. minds in the history of business and minds. And they can't figure out a way to lessen the games and still make money off of it. Make it make sense, Charlie Kravitz. Admit, yeah, Charlie, as a representative. As a representative. Of the owners. Representative yeah. of an ownership. <laughs> you, as a, yeah. As, you you damn right. make it make I, sense. I, we, we I just want to watch good basketball. <laughs> on this damn podcast, Charlie. And you better <laughs> pick a damn side. I, I'm, Charlie's with us. I'm on your side. Yeah, well, then stop blaming KD for ruining the NBA. And then he, he didn't have to. He, did, he had 28 teams to sign with. He couldn't sign with LeBron, and he couldn't sign with Curry. That's yeah. it. KD, Don't blame KD him. He signed him with the Warriors broken. did hurt the league. It did. And you know why it happened? Because of max salaries and because That's of the, the salary bump in that season. It's That's all fair. because these fools don't know how to act. And I'm, I'm blaming people for it. Uh, do you want your job to be harder? If somebody said, hey, I'm going to give you the same amount of money to go work hey, harder over there. Dominique, you, you know who we're not talking about? And this time we'll close the segment. We're not talking about the sun. So goodbye, Kevin Durant. We'll see, we'll see you when, when you uh, get a more stacked team. You don't get the last word? <laughs> word. There we go. Thank you, Wasney Lambry, for joining us. And I appreciate uh, you hanging on well, and course, having some man. fun with us. Look forward to having you on a bunch more times. Yeah, my guys, you, man, anytime. You got a gold jacket coming in the mail. Right. You was trying to get the last word again. Word. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Charlie Kravitz. Thank you to all the awesome producers that we got here. Megan, Kevin, Brian, Serafina. Uh, I miss you, Pogba. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.